Hey YouTube, it's Mike. I got a very important video for you today. I hope you got about 15 minutes to sit back and uh, relax and listen to these soldiers. They were used as guinea pigs. Sound familiar? Like something that's going on today on a worldwide scale? So why don't you watch this and see what you think? Here you go. Between 1946 and 1962, as many as 400,000 United States soldiers and sailors took part in atmospheric nuclear testing. Yes, I'm a little perplexed right now. Starting to think about things. Yeah, my wife's the only person I ever told. I never told anybody, not my parents, not my brother, not my best friend, not my wife, nobody. I go in tears talking about it now. It, it's effective. I'd like to think it hasn't affected me. I'd like to think I, I can tough it out and everything's okay. It has affected me. I will admit to it. Um, we just saw a little bit of it now. Um, I can't watch the bomb. Hood was the biggest... Uh, Killer bomb uh, blown up within the continental United States. <clears throat> the morning of July 5th, 1957, about four in the morning, they put us in a trench. Uh, I think it was a mile from ground zero or less. I was in a platoon with 40 other people, and uh, we had a for protection, we just had our utility jackets, our weapons, uh, helmets, and a gas mask. The attitude in the trenches was these people were concerned, but they didn't know what was going to happen. They had no idea. And uh, they were, you know, these were some pretty well trained, trained men, so it was not a I don't think they would have been trained to go into combat, shoot people without any problem. But they didn't know what this bomb was. We followed the instructions, which were to crouch down, uh, put our backs towards the, uh, the shot, and uh, bow our heads and cover our, our eyes. And we got to the point that everybody's basically in the trenches and it's about they started the countdown, they went 59, 58, 57. I got my gas mask on, I had trouble sensing it down. And it got down to nine, I grabbed my helmet, put it up to my head about like that, and the bomb went off. It really was the most I'll never experience anything like it again, I know that. It was completely daylight at midnight. Brighter than the brightest day you ever saw. I cannot begin to describe the light that came into my eye. I was totally blinded when I came out of the blindness. I saw my hands and by this time I actually saw the blood vessels and in my bones in my arm. You could literally just see every bone in there, everything. Even the guys bones and back that was in front of you. That's how bright the light was. To go from through the back of your head, through your eyes, and into your fingers, you're seeing your bones in your hand. How did that, how did it come through all that to get to your bones? That you could visually see them, like an x-ray. The light faded. There's like streaks of lightning from ground, from the ground
down to the sky about every two feet around you. And then that faded and it was like giant fireballs in front of your eyes. When the wave hit me, uh, in a, it, it knocked me over. Uh, I actually flipped over. All of us fell down on the ground. The blast caught me in the face, broke my glasses, knocked me on my butt, put a whole bunch of shrapnel in my face. It's mostly like uh, little glass beads that were melted glass beads in my neck and had a hole in my neck and one in my lip. And, and it felt just like it would take a red hot iron, like an iron with an eye on an ironing board, and put it to your neck. People screaming uh, and, and running, and there was panic. There was panic and people screaming because of the heat. Everybody started yelling and, and some people calling out for their mothers. And, uh, some of the trenches collapsed. I don't know. It's like I had lost it. And uh, I don't know why. Because um, I'm losing it right now. The whole clump of ground, 10 yards this way, 15 yards this way, 10 yards back over here, you guys were having a little trouble, they were throwing you up from this normal thing, I guess. We had to dig two guys out. And we're standing there watching the mushroom cloud form, and you could see it. But the naked eyes just sucked all the sand out. <clears throat> there was, people were gathering then, kind of coming back and looking at this spectacular, spectacular shot. It was, it actually, you're gonna die when I, when I tell you this, it was, it was so big. It, it, it looked, it, the colors were beautiful in a sense, I hate to say that. You see this molten cloud changing color as, as it, it kind of turns within itself. Beautiful purple with lavender and popping and flipping and just doing. And it was boiling and just orange and reds and blacks and gray and whatever. And it kept boiling and rolling like this. And the higher it got, the more it flowed outward. It, that thing just keep. it seems like it keeps on going and it keeps expanding. And then it reaches a point where it kind of colors up at the top. As it closed in, it was uh, a huge red ring all the way around as far as you could see from the horizon on, or from the horizon. And as it closed up like an aperture on a camera, on one side of the red ring was daylight, on the other side was night. I saw planes going through it, which, you know, even at its growth stage, they were, we were flying aircraft through it. Uh, they took roll call, and there were two people that were missing, but we went on without them, never found out again what, what happened to those two. Um, there were a number of trucks that were turned over on their sides, and things like tires and whatever were smoldering from the fire. And I seen all the steel, from bulldozers, cranes, cars, Trucks, everything, completely destroyed. And when you see a bulldozer blade rip like paper, you know it's powerful. The tank retriever was the main tank. That huge chunk of metal ended up to be a, a puddle the size of a chair. In the course of this, there was a one-star general, Marine general, who was, who was bewildered and uh, I guess he had kind of lost, temporary loss is cool. And he says, I don't know where I am. I've lost my men, I've lost my men. And, and I says, I says, calm down, General. I says, look, I says, I, I've been in a few of these shots now. It's okay, we just gotta wait till the dust settles a little bit. And uh, <clears throat> he was all upset. I, I, I don't know, I think I calmed him down, but he was uh, pretty upset. And I seen some guys coming towards us, like to the right of us, towards the bomb, even. Like 
and then walking towards us as we were walking to the left of the blast. And I thought, what are they wearing? They have some kind of different clothes on because things were dangling like they had padded clothes or something. It looked odd. And uh, through some other people and, and talking over the years, I, I think it was their flesh. Nobody had uniforms that dangled like that. Uh, yeah, I, th I think a lot of us knew that this was not a good thing for us. The only thing that they did for us was for us to secrecy we, we couldn't talk about it we couldn't talk about it to anybody for ten thousand dollar fine or ten years in prison everyone was told that you're never ever to discuss this again that what you saw stays with you forever you can't tell your wife you can't tell your kids and particularly you can't talk amongst yourself so you can't turn to your buddy and say, gee, what'd you think of that shot? Or have any discussion regarding the atomic bomb. That's where the paranoia was. They put the fear of God in you. You know, the, you know when you start talking about treason, they, you can be executed. That's, a, that's enough to, I mean, go to jail is one thing, but treason. It, it haunts me to think of what I had witnessed and not realized at the time the import of what we were doing at the time actually serving as guinea pigs we were just it was like an experiment animal to use in the lab when i got out of the military i had after effects like i was losing my hair i had uh, spine problems and this and that i have spent a number of years when I was out of the service waking up in the middle of the night seeing the atomic bomb. I didn't sleep for a long time, very well. Well, I would always have this bright light that would flash on. Hello, time to get up. No, no, it isn't. No light bulb out there, Turkey. You're just screaming, you, you know. I had developed a, uh, a tumor in 04 when I went down and registered as an atomic vet. And it uh, turned out that the tumor was called swanoma tumor. It was caused by ionized radiation. And uh, for 10 years now, I've been trying to get uh, compensation for that, but the, the government does not want to admit to anybody that was that was harmed by any radiation. They've been they've been putting me off for over ten years now. Well they knew everything that was gonna happen and what danger was involved in it. They're just hoping you all die before they have to do anything. I don't know that anybody will ever know. Uh, because I suspect that nobody will give a damn uh, when I'm gone. If it was done for science and, and the availability to, to the rest of the human race to know that, uh, that we don't need it, it's way too devastating. If you could just see the colors, if you could just hear it, hear it, not on the television or in the movie, but the actual thing, I, I think you would agree with me, whoever is listening to this. All right, there you have it. The Atomic Veterans. These guys were incredible heroes. I uh, can't believe that they are still alive today. 
to share this with us. God bless everyone. I'll see you next video. Have a wonderful day.